my name is Allie Fernbach. I am the nurse practitioner for the survivorship program at Columbia. Um, first off, I want to thank Alex's Lemonade Stand for inviting me to speak today. I will be discussing the late medical and psychosocial effects of childhood cancer treatment. So before I go into all the potential late effects, um, I want to let you know that this discussion usually provokes anxiety amongst our parents and the, um, the patients as well. I will be discussing a variety of potential late effects, but it's important to know that um, almost no survivor gets all the late effects, and in fact, some survivors don't get any of the late effects. Um, the whole point of discussing the risks for late effects are to increase awareness and um, allow the parents or, or the survivors to advocate for their needs later in life. Um, the other thing that's important to know are that the risks are determined by exposure. So if I'm talking about a particular type of chemotherapy that your child didn't receive, then they're not at risk for that particular um, late effect. So um, there are 12,000 new diagnoses of childhood cancers every year. Um, the five-year overall survival rate is close to 80% now, which means that now there are over um, 300,000 survivors of childhood cancer in the United States. One out of every 640 young adults in the U.S. are survivors of childhood cancers, and the number of survivors is growing. Um, so this is now, the late effects is sort of an up-and-coming field, and it's becoming more and more important and prevalent among um, providers. So I know this graph may be hard for you to read on your um, printouts, but what it's basically showing is that 50 years ago, survival rates in many diseases were pretty dismal, but um, because of improvements in treatment and supportive care, there's been increases in survival in almost all diseases. However, as most of you probably know, um, treatment for childhood cancer is not benign. There are long-term complications as well as late effects, and these can um, impact a child or cancer survivor's quality of life. So what are late effects? Um, they are adverse long-term health-related outcomes that result um, from the cancer or the treatment, and they're dependent on several factors. The first are the um, tumor-related factors, which include the location of the tumor, the direct tissue, that the tumor may affect, and the tumor-induced organ dysfunction, so if the tumor is pressing on a kidney or something. Um, there's also treatment-related factors, such as um, if, you were to get if someone got radiation, the total dose, um, which organ received the radiation, and the type of machine. Now there's proton machines and photon machines. Um, they each have different late effects. In addition, um, chemotherapy, uh, the type of chemotherapy, the dose of chemotherapy, the, the schedule, whether, if it, whether it was monthly, every two weeks, that can sometimes um, change the potential late effect for someone. In regards to surgery, um, the type of surgery, whether it was laparoscopic or whether it was a major surgery where they had to, you know, very invasive. Um, the host-related factors, include gender, so some females are at higher risk for some late effects um, than males. Age of diagnosis, uh, for instance, a younger child who had a brain tumor in the past, if they were treated with radiation at a young age, they might have more late effects than an older child with that same cancer. Um, the time from diagnosis and therapy, so um, some late effects present early on and some present later in life and um, the developmental status of a patient also affects their late effects. Um, genetic predisposition, socioeconomic status, as well as health habits, so if they smoke, if they drink, those kind of things. So why is it important to know about these late effects? Um, it helps our patients and their parents to identify warning signals, and that way they can, they can also develop a plan for surveillance. Um, the most important thing is that it prepares our si survivors to advocate for their well-being. And um, when they are prepared, they can help educate others, such as their teachers, and you know, if they have special needs at school, they're, it might not have, they might not have understood that before, the school system, but um, they can help educate and make changes. 
So um, here's a list of the body systems that are potentially affected by cancer in its treatment. It's really essentially all body systems. I'm gonna go, going to highlight some of the more important ones though, or more serious. So first is um, second malignancies, which is second um, cancers. The primary contributing agents to those are radiation and um, types of chemotherapy. <laughs> called epididophilotoxins. Um, an example of that is etoposide. Other cancer-causing agents are anthracyclines, such as doxorubicin, and some alkylating agents. An example of an alkylating agent is cyclophosphamide. So in general, radiation causes solid tumors to the area of the radiation, um, including skin cancers. And this, the risk continues to rise as the patient ages, or the survivor ages. Um, chemotherapeutic agents, on the other hand, tend to cause leukemia and lymphoma. And this seems to diminish by 10 years post-therapy. So um, this is a chart, if you can see the middle, the middle line there, the darker one, that's the cumulative incidence of breast cancer as a function of age. So these are Hodgkin's um, disease survivors and over time their incidence of breast cancer increases. Mm -hmm. And this is due to the radiation to the chest. So the next toxicity I'm gonna to talk about is cardiac toxicity. Uh, there are many forms of toxicity. The first is cardiomyopathy, which is a deterioration of the function of the heart muscle. Um, the second is pericarditis, which is the inflammation around the sac um, surrounding the heart. The third is congestive heart failure, which is um, when the heart can't pump, pump enough blood to meet the body's needs. Uh, valvular heart disease, which is a disease of the heart valves, and coronary artery disease, which is the narrowing of the vessels that supply blood and oxygen to the heart. So the primary contributing agents to cardiac toxicity are anthracyclines, um, examples of those doxorubicin and donorubicin. Um, and also radiation that impacts the heart. Um, this can include radiation to the abdomen that has scatter, radiation to the thyroid that can also scatter, um, and of course the spine and the lungs. So to assess cardiac toxicity, um, we do routine echocardiograms and electrocardiograms. If, I'll discuss um, the frequency of those later on and how that's determined. Um, another. Important toxicity is uh, toxicity of the endocrine system, and this can include problems with puberty, infertility, abnormal growth, as well as um, thyroid dysfunction. Um, so in males, I'm gonna first discuss um, testicular dysfunction. So from chemotherapy and radiation, um, both of these can damage sperm cells or hormone-producing cells, either um, in the brain or in the testicles. Um, so the most common chemotherapies that affect sperm are alkylating agents, such as cyclophosphamide. Um, other examples are procarbazine and iphosphamide. And then radiation to either the brain or the testicles can also affect the ability to produce sperm. Other risk factors for testicular dysfunction include age, pubertal status, type and dose of chemotherapy, location and dose of radiation, as well as the surgical area. You know, so if a, if a, if a young man or a child had a testicle removed, they would be at a higher risk of infertility, but they still may be fertile. Uh, so manifestations of testicular dysfunction in males include decreased sperm count, absent sperm count, which is considered infertility, or delayed puberty. So in females, this is the whole process in one line, um, they're born with a certain number of eggs, it's close to a million, and those diminish as we age, and once we're, all of our eggs are gone, that's the time that females go into menopause. So uh, treatment damage, either chemotherapy or radiation, can speed up the damage of those eggs, so you run out of eggs a lot younger in life. Um, so risk factors for females include age, type and dose of chemotherapy, location and dose of radiation, as well as the surgical area. Manifestations in females of ovarian dysfunction include a reduction of the total egg count, premature ovarian failure or premature menopause, 
and along with those, if a young, if a young girl has premature ovarian failure before puberty, um, it may hinder her ability to actually go into puberty. In addition, um, if a teenager or young woman develops premature menopause, of course there's the um, risk of infertility, but we also worry about the side effects of menopause, including osteoporosis. So in order to assess the ovarian and testicular function, in males we look at their hormone levels, their luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, as well as their testosterone, um, to determine if they do have sperm that are mobile, they can do a semen analysis. This is only available for postpubertal boys. Um, and also a physical exam to make sure they are progressing through puberty normally. In females, um, we also check their hormones, which is the luteinizing hormone, the follicle stimulating hormone, and the estradiol. We also do a physical exam to make sure they're also progressing through puberty. Um, and then there, there is technology to measure, measure ovarian reserve, so the number of follicles in an ovary. Um, it's not so accurate right now. You can either do an ultrasound or they're also looking at one of the hormones, anti-malarian hormone. There's actually gonna be a big national study for Hodgkin's disease patients looking at anti-malarian hormone infertility. So another late effect um, are neurocognitive deficits. These usually become evident within one to two years following treatment. And it's, you see it as a progressive development, so um, a gap increases between survivors and their peers. We see academic difficulties in reading, language, and math, and there may be drops in IQ. The primary contributing agents to neurocognitive late effects include radiation to the brain, high-dose methotrexate or cytarabine, and intrathecal chemotherapy. So that's the chemotherapy that's injected into the spinal column. Um, risk factors for no cognitive late effects include um, higher dose of radiation, a younger age, co-treatment of radiation with intrathecal medications, and females who are at a higher risk for these effects. So to assess neurocognitive function, um, there we give parent questionnaires. Um, we also ask for observations by teachers and physicians. Um, there are IQ screening tests and um, neurological assessments by a neuropsychologist. Psychosocial aid effects. So one of the um, biggest, one of the most feared things that survivors have is a fear of recurrence. Um, this may change over time. It, it may, they may not be bothered by the fear of relapse until it's time for the yearly appointment or they have to go back to the hospital for some sort of screening or um, test. But each survivor deals with these feelings differently and it's, ve it's very normal and we see it in all of our survivors. Um, but for those who have fears that are interfering with their life on a daily basis, we do encourage them to seek psychosocial support. Um, our survivors also experience grief and feelings of grief and loss, um, partially because the cancer has um, robbed their childhood, their family of a normal childhood, and their siblings and their parents. Um, loss is also common loss of ability, skills, or body parts. And they also, sometimes they report losing their friends that they had before they were treated for cancer, and this is another loss they experience. Um, we also see anger. They ask, why did this happen to me? Um, anxiety related to um, fear of losses that may come in the future, or fear of relapse or delayed effects. And sometimes this anxiety or fear can interfere with our patients actually seeking help and being monitored for late effects because they don't want to know. So we do encourage, you know, mental health support for patients. <coughs> excuse me, who may feel that way. Um, as we heard earlier in the law, uh, lecture, um, they also experienced survivor guilt. Um, the feeling that they survived and others did not. So we also see, um, sometimes see issues in relationships. Either it changes, the relationship changed with their parents and their friends and their siblings. Um, survivors had reported feeling that dating is more difficult it, particularly starting a relationship with someone else, 
Um, sometimes they report that they're afraid that they're gonna, their cancer is going to come back and they don't want someone else to have to go through that with them. They report body image issues. The cancer may have changed their body appearance um, and also how they may view themselves. The difference, the body change may be obvious, such as an amputation, or it may be a private one, such as the loss of a testicle, um, and also scars that are visible can cause uh, a patient to feel insecure about their body image. Um, people may have issues with disclosure, so telling um, their friends, their family, their coworkers about their cancer. They may have issues getting jobs. I know there was a lecture before this about that. Um, either, you know, I have one patient who is, she has a, she received a four quarter amputation so she doesn't have her shoulder and her left arm. Um, and she's finding it very hard to get a job because she, you know, she can only type with one hand. She can't lift anything. Of course, there are jobs out there, but it's, it's very limited for her. And that's an example. Um, also getting educational services for patients who need that. Sometimes parents really need to be advocates and you know, my colleagues at the hospital, the social workers, the neuropsychologists to get um, our patients' needs from the schools. And there also are insurance issues, which hopefully won't be such big issues because of the changes in the, um, in the Affordable Care Act. So adolescents who are cancer survivors experience higher rates of inattention social withdrawal, emotional problems, and they also externalize their problems. Approximately 50 to 20 percent experience some form of PTSD. In psychosocial outcomes, the female survivors achieved fewer developmental milestones during adolescence. Male survivors were more likely to live with their parents at a later age in life. Um, male and females were less likely to have married or had children and both sexes were also significantly older at their first marriage and birth of their first child. There are some positives. Um, most survivors are psychologically healthy and report overall life satisfaction. The scores of global distress amongst our survivors are lower than the general population, and they do have a modest reduction in alcohol drinking. So these are quotes from actual survivors. Um, the first one is, I am in constant, unpleasant awareness of my body and panic that cancer or a related illness will follow. I learned not to take good health and life itself for granted. I learned to throw myself into everything I do. I learned patience and perspective. We are grateful our daughter is a survivor. Nonetheless, we need to find a way to help her so she can have the quality of life she wants and deserves. There have been changes um, in the past several years in therapy to minimize late effects. For instance, um, a lot of the current clinical trials avoid radiation to the brain in children less than five. They also avoid radiation to the chest in adolescent females to prevent secondary breast cancer. Um, we do use radiation more often in males with Hodgkin's disease to reduce sterility from alkylating agents, those are the chemotherapies, such as um, cyclophosphamide and procarbazine. And also to prevent um, scoliosis, they're now irradiating the total spine rather than a small section of the spine. In addition, chemotherapy, there are some protocols where it's less toxic. So children with leukemia between the ages of one and 10 with a low white blood cell count are cured with less intensive chemotherapy. Um, they're also using more intensive intrathecal um, chemotherapy to avoid radiation. For low stage solid tumors, such as neuroblastoma and Wilms tumor, some may be cured with surgery alone. And in um, osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, they're now doing pre-surgical chemotherapy to shrink the tumor before, rem before removing it surgically so that the surgery is not as extensive. There are interventions that can be done prior to therapy. This is my specialty, sperm banking at Columbia. Um, so boys who are post-pubital, um, we do encourage them to sperm bank prior to therapy and a majority of them are able to do that. Um, there are experimental studies going on, I believe at, one is at CHOP, about testicular cryopreservation, which is 
um, the ability to preserve a piece of the testicle of a prepubital boy in hopes that it can be used in the future to create a child. In girls, um, the standard of care is embryo cryopreservation, which is the freezing of the egg with a sperm. Um, there are a few issues that make this harder than sperm banking. The first is you often need a couple of weeks, at least two weeks, um, because the woman has to take hormones and ovulate. Um, so there's typically not enough time for a female cancer patient in pediatrics to do this before starting therapy. Um, because they typically present so sick, our patients, um, it makes it very difficult to do that. The other two, the oocyte cryopreservation and the ovarian cryopreservation, those are both not standard of care at this point, um, but they are available. But the, the oocyte cryopreservation is the, the, just the preservation of the egg, and so that's only available for post-pubital girls. Um, they are looking into ovarian cryopreservation, which is freezing a piece of the ovary and storing it in prepubital girls and then possibly implanting it back in after therapy. So there are interventions that are used during therapy to prevent late effects. The first is the use of dextrazoxane, which is a type of intravenous medication. It protects the heart um, for patients who are receiving doxorubicin. And then after therapy, uh, patients are encouraged to anticipate, screen, and recognize late effects through a structured follow-up program. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they um, recommend that pediatric oncology centers should have a mechanism for ensuring long-term follow-up of successfully treated patients, either at the original treatment center or by a specialist who is familiar with the potential adverse effects of treatment for childhood cancer. And I put this in because um, I, it's very important that if you're not being monitored for late effects, you find someone who can monitor for you, go to a specialist or something, uh, someone who can have the knowledge and follow you, follow you or your child. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our survivorship program, which is probably similar to CHOP and other um, hospitals that you may go to. So ours is called the Center for Survivor Wellness. It's the long-term follow-up at Columbia. It consists of a multidisciplinary team. There are two doctors, um, a nurse practitioner, myself. We have a clinical coordinator, a survivor navigator, a nutritionist, an exercise physiologist, and a neuropsychologist. And our program is philanthropically funded. And patients are considered survivors um, in our program once they are at least two years out of therapy or five years from diagnosis. And typically we are not um, screening our patients for recurrent disease, we are just looking at late effects. So at the first visit at our survivorship clinic, our patients receive a treatment summary, which includes a summary of their treatment, a list of potential late effects, and the plan for routine health screening. And um, you need to have this information about you or your child to know what your survivorship plan should be. So here's an example of a treatment summary. Um, as you can see, it has the diagnosis, the date of diagnosis, the protocol, which um, as I was saying earlier, we receive a lot of patients from outside institutions and often we don't have this information, so if I know the protocol, I can get a good understanding of what they might have received. Um, the types of chemotherapy, this is cisplatin and 5-FU. The radiation, what is really important to know is the location as well as the dose. If they had any surgeries, stem cell transplant, um, complications from treatment. So this patient had hypothyroidism, high frequency fearing loss, and xerostoma, which is dry mouth. Then we have an area of recommended screening and the frequency of these screenings. Um, then there's general health maintenance, which is, as you can see there, just important for everyone, and a recommended health care visit, who they should be followed by. And the recommended screenings that I put up there come from these long-term follow-up guidelines. And these are available to the public. Um, I've highlighted the website. They're very extensive, so I'm just gonna pinpoint a few 
places in them, but um, if you ever want to look what a, a, the potential aid effects, they are there. So these screenings are recommended for asymptomatic survivors presenting for a routine exposure-based medical follow-up. And it's um, multidisciplinary system-based and it's updated as information becomes available. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, I'll show you how it breaks it down, but there's a section for all the different types of chemotherapy, radiation, and to what body parts, um, surgeries, and the um, organs affected, as well as transplants. So I know you probably can't see this on your printout, and we're not gonna really go through it, but this is, if you can see the top left corner, um, it says anthracycline, and that's what I was talking about earlier, the doxorubicin exposure, it can affect the heart. So the potential under the second column, potential late effects is cardiac toxicity. Um, and then for screening on the bottom right, it says um, echo or MUGA for evaluation of systolic function. So then there's this nice chart that this is how we determine the frequency of echocardiograms and EKG. So it's really based on if the patient received radiation that could impact the heart, as well as if they received any type of chemotherapies called anthracyclines and the dose of the anthracycline. So um, I've included the section for males on the testicular dysfunction due to the alkylating agents. And if you, so if you look in the far left corner, um, it lists the potential alkylating agents. And then the bottom right, the screening tests, so the FSH, the LH, and the testosterone. And it says underneath baseline at age 14 and is clinically indicated. And then this is the section on, um, this is a radiation section, so if a female received greater than 20 gray to any part of the chest, the mantle, or total body irradiation, um, these are the recommendations on the far right for mammogram and breast MRI screenings. So the main point of all this was it's available online and it's accessible to you. So I wanted to provide you with how to get to it. Also on that website that I highlighted earlier, there's survivorship guidelines. There are health links um, for the different organs that can be affected by the specific chemo or radiation that you or your child received. And this is an example of the breast cancer health link, but there's, um, there's heart health, there's liver health, kidney health, dental health, all sorts of um, useful links that can, you know, if you have questions about something, they may provide the information. So with these late effects, there are limitations in that um, they are moving targets. Complications do change with the era of treatment. So the treatment for acute lymphocytic leukemia 20 years ago was very different from the current treatment now. So the late effects for those patients are different than the ones who are experiencing going through the treatment now. Um, it's also difficult to tease out what caused the late effect. Um, was it the radiation? Was it the chemo? Was it one chemo versus another? Or was it, did the child already, were they at risk for this just genetically? The, also, the array and extent of late effects are constantly evolving. Um, as there become more and more childhood cancer survivors, this field is definitely growing, and there are a lot of changes being made to the late effect guidelines and follow-up. So, what have we learned in our clinic? Uh, many survivors are overall doing very well, but there are limited awareness of late effects. Recurrence does continue to be the area of main concern. Surveillance is easier with, text, with tests that are familiar. For instance, doing echoes and EKGs are very easy, but sometimes getting complicated abdominal x-rays or something to evaluate a shunt, things that are not typically regular tests um, can be a little tricky. Follow-up with nutrition and exercise is difficult. Many of our patients do see the exercise physiologist and the nutritionist, but um, follow-up is very difficult because they live far away or they're not accessible via email. Access to healthcare is more difficult post-treatment. At times of transition, insurance may lapse. Educational services are lacking and socioeconomic disparities do exist. 
So we encourage our survivors to figure out how to navigate the systems, and we're trying to figure it out as well. Um, through ed the education systems, being tested for um, neuropsychological deficits. Uh, many of our patients are eligible for a 504 plan, and they do use it, so they get extra time on tests. They're able to use calculators. Um, also, <clears throat> being evaluated to whether they need an IEP for, which is an individualized educational program, um, may be an effective way to help them through school. Legal protection, um, we heard earlier, they're, the, what, what's your company called again? Cancer Legal Resources, they're um, a, a company that can help with uh, legal issues. Insurance, um, it's important that our patients have health insurance all the time, even when they're healthy, and life insurance is something to think about, and also figuring out the job system. So in order to stay healthy, we encourage regular medical follow-up, um, healthy diet, exercise, no, no drug use, and what we say about alcohol it, for people of age is um, we encourage alcohol intake um, in moderation just because uh, the liver and kidneys have already been through a lot because of the chemotherapy or the radiation. Um, no smoking, safe sex, and um, protection when in the sun. For psychosocial health, um, access to programs to address their unique psychosocial, educational, and vocational issues is important. Uh, their resources are lacking in that field because of funding. So the take home points, knowing exposures and the treatment is necessary to define risks. The most important thing is ask for a treatment summary and a surveillance plan from provider. And as parents, you can help your child understand their treatment when they are ready because they're the ones that are probably going to need to advocate for their health and their needs later in life.